It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's Foreign Policy Forum at the American Academy in Berlin. Special welcome to our trustees, John Kornblum and Kati Martin. And of course, we're very grateful to the Daimler Funds for their generous support of this series. And we're very happy to welcome back to the American Academy uh, our alumna Bosch Fellow from 2012, uh, Professor Karen Alter, uh, Professor of Political Science and Law at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, Karen is a permanent visiting professor at the I Court Center for Excellence, the University of Copenhagen Faculty of Law, and co-director of the research group on global capitalism and law at the Buffett Institute of Northwestern University. Her topic tonight, the future of international law in the age of Trump. She will be introduced uh, formally, informally, seriously, uh, by Professor Thomas Risse, a uh, professor of international relations at the Freie Universität and director of the Center for Transnational Relations, Foreign and Security Policy. Uh, professor Risse has uh, taken leadership positions in several projects funded by the German Research Foundation. Uh, recently, uh, a project called Overlapping Scientific Communities, Internal Structuration and Knowledge Diffusion in International Relations, and the collaborative research center called Governance in Areas of Limited Statehood. <clears throat> Among many other projects, he is also the founding director of the Berlin Graduate School for Transnational Studies, a joint PhD program of the Freie Universität, Social Science Center Berlin, and the Hertie School of Governance. He is also the chair of the executive committee of the joint master's program in international relations of the FU, the Humboldt Universität and the University of Potsdam. Uh, as you can see, we will have the talk followed by a conversation uh, between uh, Karen Alter and Thomas Risse. We'll have some time for questions and then you're cordially invited to uh, our traditional reception next door. So welcome. Uh, when you a let me say one more thing. When you ask your question, uh, please wait for uh, the microphone. Please introduce yourself uh, as efficiently as you can, and please ask a question that it ac actually is a question, uh, and 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 th and that and that and that leaves some time for our guests to answer your question, uh, and then everybody will be happy, and uh, we look forward to the event. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michael. Does this work or does this work, or both? Okay, so uh, can you hear me all good? Good, so, uh, so the not, now actually it's a serious introduction. Um, uh, since Michael was so kind to already say where, uh, who Karen Alter is, you know, she got her PhD at the MIT and so forth, so, uh, et cetera, and so, so forth, this is all done. I want to do a, kindly, uh, a slightly different introduction. Um, and it starts with a story, a personal story. As I, uh, I told it already to two lawyers who are in the room, <laughs> so they know what's coming. Um, when I was a PhD student in Frankfurt at the Frankfurt Peace Research Institute uh, in the 1980s, my supervisor, a famous German political scientist who just died this year, Ernst Otto Schempiel, one of the first one of the first things he told me, forget about international law. It does not matter if you want to study international politics, international law does not matter. Okay, I learned my lesson. I tried to ignore international law for some time. Um, we studied in the 1980s and then 1990s in international relations, that's sort of my political science angle of it. Uh, we studied norms. We didn't think about law, we thought norms. Uh, and then at some point, somebody stepped into the conversation, and that's the woman I'm going to introduce tonight, that's Karen Alter. Karen Alter, essentially, and, and the one-liner on Karen Alter is, uh, she taught 
political scientists, international relations scholars, both in the United States and in Europe, to take law seriously. And that the language of law actually matters. And if you want to study international relations, you have to study international law too. I'm not making a big point that everybody complies with international law all the time. That's not my point. But Karen Alter's job, your job description, from the 1990s on, was essentially to tell, uh, uh, to tell us that. That was the time when the, um, how put it, uh, the, uh, the intersection between law and political science uh, in Germany, but also in the United States, didn't really exist. In Germany, this uh, actually, we forgot about our own tradition. In Germany, political science was called Staatswissenschaften, the science of the state once, you know, very early on. Uh, and at that time, it was integrated with law, but we, f we forgot uh, the entire connection. And this is again where, where Karen Alter comes in. I mean, she, she personifies, if you want, uh, the relationship between political science and international law. She, she talks, she is conversing both in the legal language and in the political science language. She, she is a true uh, bridge builder. And I can go through the publications. The latest one, the book is out now, you said. OK, uh, she just, uh, the, the, the book that just came out is The Law and Politics of the Andean Tribunal uh, of Justice. And that just came out with Oxford University Press. And I like the Andean Tribunal because it's a really f interesting court because it has sort of a, I mean, I'm probably wrong, so <laughs> Karen has to correct me on this one. Um, uh, it's the, the Andean trib Tribunal is a one-to-one -one translation of the European Court of Justice statute <coughs> in a different environment in Latin America. So it works slightly differently. And, and, uh, and Karen's latest book is, is exactly on this. Uh, the, la the, the, the book before uh, was with, uh, with Princeton University Press, The New Terrain of International Law, Courts, Politics, Rights. So, she is a real bridge builder between the social sciences, political science, international relations on the one hand, and international law uh, on the other. And our profession as political scientists owes her an enormous uh, uh, debt for actually telling us what, again and again that actually law matters and we have to take it seriously. So please. introduction and it's so wonderful to be back here. Thanks all for coming out tonight to talk about um, the future of international law in an age of Trump. Um, so I'm going to in inflict something rather American on you. Uh, on Friday I was at a seminar on women in STEM and improvisation and dynamic communication coming from the idea that we have the science and no one listens to it, mostly climate science, and so therefore it's a communication problem. So they gave us training with an improv person in Second City, so you're going to get some of my techniques tonight. And so they said, I have to grab you in the first 20 seconds in a participative way. So when I say international law, if you can just quickly say out, what international laws do you know of that come to mind? The Law of the Seas Tribunal, uh, Convention, yeah. That's an international lawyer. Geneva Convention. The Geneva Conventions. <laughs> Any other ones? Trade and torture. Trade and torture. Are there international laws that you know of? The Rome Statute. The International Criminal Courts Rome Statute. There's lots of them. The Hague Court, so courts and institutions. Excellent. So the Law of the Seas um, is actually one of my favorite international laws. I'm going to talk about it uh, soon, but that's a lawyer who would put that in the room because I don't think that would come out for most, most people. I was expecting, and I did get a lot of examples of international law that doesn't really work yeah. um, and, and the problems of international law. So why am I giving this talk? And this talk is based on an essay I wrote on the future of international law that's available on SSRN if you want to read the, the deeper version of it. 
And um, obviously it's motivated by the current times, and you're going to see that. But it's also motivated by a, time, uh, a change that came place. So when I was at the academy, I was finishing my book, The New Terrain of International Law. And it's, always, it's mostly a backwards-looking book, as social science is. And so it's very risky to then start to make declarations and pronostications. But this is what I said towards the end of the book. I said, of course, the importance of international legal norms is everywhere apparent. Governments do not cross borders and seize commodities they want, nor do they annex valuable lands, except shortly thereafter Russia went into the Crimea. <laughs> Chemical and biological weapons are considered politically off limits, even though they may be militarily effective, as the Syrian government now knows. And tariffs are seldom the protectionist tool of choice, even though they bring revenue and provide clear evidence of a political commitment to protecting jobs at home. And of course, the border tax plan, which I don't think is going to reappear but was exactly putting on tariffs again, and that's also a central thing that Trump would like to do. Um, so it's starting to look like all of these statements are call called into question. Um, but it's really this guy, of course, who has a wrecking ball to the, old, the whole international liberal order. And so thinking about these current times and what it means for this whole body of work that I've been translating and doing is what's motivating this talk. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about some basic things about international law. And this is how, as a, as a political scientist, I look at the institution of international law in ways that are enduring and not going to change. So I'm actually going to argue that international law is not under threat, but the international liberal order is under threat. So I'm going to remind you of some things about international law that are not going to change. And then I'm going to say international law is not under threat because of these things, these foundations of international law, but the liberal international mm -hmm. order is. And then what does, on what does the future of international law depend? So some basic things we need to remember about international law. One starts with this famous quote by Lewis Hankin, which is very well known and actually completely undisputed. Almost all nations observe almost all principles of international law almost all of the time. That has always been true and will continue to be true for very good reasons. And I'm going to illustrate this with the law of the sea, which I think is one of the most remarkable accomplishments of international law. It is the law that regulates both where the territorial border ends and the seas begin and of how different actors and countries can use the high seas. It's, it is the rules of the road that we have for the ocean. It's a tremendous achievement of international law. Why, I'm using this as an example, but this is why almost all international law is obeyed. Because first of all, it codifies existing practice. Part of the reasons you wanted to nail down the law of the sea convention was that countries kept trying to shift the border further and further into the sea. And so by codifying it, you stopped this practice of unilateral assertions to shift the border. But it primarily codified the status quo. Um, because international law defines the rules of international relations that states agree to and want, and they would still agree to it, and they would still want it. Because nations need to coordinate to address common bads, common problems, all of the problems that take advantage, the pirates that take advantage of the high seas, the drug traders, the human traffickers. If you want to address these problems, you don't want a lawless domain. Uh, and so these problems exist in international law is the language of international governance. It's how you make agreements and how you govern. Because following the law is the path of least resistance. If you don't want to be arrested or be taken as a pirate, you're going to pretend that you're law abiding and you're going to follow the law. If you're a new government who comes to power, you want to pick your fights. And most of your fights are not worth picking, so you're going to follow the law. And because people, groups, and firms value the rule of law. So for all of these reasons, and it is undisputed, almost all principles of international law are followed almost all the times. I'm not really worried about the law of the sea in an age of Trump, because it's going to keep being reinforced. There's no alternative to it. The second point is how international law is built and sustained. And I have this pretty picture of a bird that is a collage. And the idea is that international law is built and sustained through redundancy, by embedding international law into national, the fabric of the national legal system, by creating institutions that are where you practice this international law and contest this international law and enforce it, by shaping expectations, and in particular for human rights, by shaping the content of constitutions. And I'm going to illustrate all of these points with the example of torture and then tell you why this matters. So torture has a longer history, but I'm going to start in 1948 with the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, a General Assembly Declaration, non-binding, soft law, includes this provision, no one shall be subjected to torture, to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. 
Obviously, it includes a lot more provisions, but I want to show you the redundancy and the multiple layers that are inherent to international law with just this one example. At the same time that this soft law non-binding provision comes out, the Inter-American Convention, which actually predates by six months the UN Declaration, also has word for word the same provision. The European Convention, Article 3, and then later the Banjo Charter, Article 5. So the, and those are hard law agreements. So that gets replicated in regionally based hard law agreements. It also then gets built in through the practice of judges and of countries. So in 1981, this very famous decision, Phil Artiga versus Peña Aurelia, from the US Court of Appeals, it's important for many reasons. It resurrected the alien tort statute, which if you're a lawyer, you know is now under contestation. Um, but it also declared that torture is a violation of the law of nations. For the alien tort statute to work, which was a uh, two foreigners are suing each other in American courts, Federal jurisdiction can be claimed only for violations of the law of nations. So the litigants had to show that torture was a violation of the law of nations. It was a Paraguayan who found that the torture of her dead brother was in the United States, and she sued in a U.S. court against a Paraguayan official, and the torture had taken place in Paraguay. In the ruling, the judge says, having examined the sources for, for which, from which customary international laws derived, the usage of nations, judicial opinions, the works of jurists, we conclude that official torture is now prohibited by the law of nations. The prohibition is clear and unambiguous and admits no distinction between the treatment of aliens and citizens. While the ultimate scope of those rights will be a subject for continuing refinement and elaboration, we hold the right to be free from torture is now among them. So one of the ways that international law gets built is through custom which is also how common law gets built. So this really is directly analogous to the common law system. And the usage then of nations becomes a basis. If countries follow the soft law universal declaration and replicate that torture is now prohibited, then you can find a hard law binding nature through customary international law. The time the ruling is made in 1981, this is before the Convention Against Torture, and one of the usage things that the judge notes is that 55 national constitutions prohibit torture. <coughs> Why are they prohibiting torture? That's partly because they're, they're part of the European Convention on Human Rights. They're part of the Latin American system. So those other provisions that I told you then translate into national constitutions, 1981, 55 constitutions. Then we get the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel and Inhuman Degrading Treatments. The acronym for it is CAT, C-A-T. It's a General Assembly Convention passed in 1984. If you remember the judge and the Phil Artiga said it's going to need refinement and elaboration. That's what this treaty does. It refines and it elaborates. It gets ratified by enough countries so it becomes binding hard law in 1987. There are now 162 state parties. All the green countries are members of the Convention Against Torture. The light green ones have signed but not ratified. And the gray ones, of which are few and far between but in Asia, um, have not signed or ratified. So this convention is going to take that universal declaration and turn it into hard law, but it's going to do more than that. It's going to define torture far more clearly than that first provision. It's going to say no exceptional circumstances whatsoever can be used to justify torture. And it has Article 2, which says each state party shall take effective legislative, administrative, judicial, or other measures to prevent acts of torture in any territory under its jurisdiction. So that means that you have to change the national law in order to give, enact this so that administratively, legislatively, judicially, you can deal with violations of torture. This provision, which the, is one of the few human rights conventions that the United States has actually signed and ratified, leads to the construction of the US domestic statute on torture, defined far more clearly than the UN declaration. There are some issues about cruel and unhuman punish, punishment, uh, human treatment that we can go into, but also defines what is severe mental pain and suffering, a lot more detail, which is why the Bush administration needed to hire John Yoo to come up with the torture memos to try to get out a very specific language, which is US language, drawn directly from the Convention Against Torture in the ratification process. And while John Yoo wrote these memos, and we did do enhanced interrogation, the memos have been universally repudiated. And so he was unsuccessful in his efforts to wiggle out of these, this clearer language in, in the Torture Convention. So the Torture Convention directly leads to further legalization. Ratifying the convention creates legal obligations to signatory states. Now when you search Tom Ginsburg's Constitution Project to see how many constitutions prohibit torture, we're now up to 150. 
And that's because of the Convention Against Torture ratification and the rewriting of constitutions. It's come into more constitutions, and that doesn't even include the criminal law statutes that I just put up. So it transformed national legal systems to create an apparatus to prosecute violations of the convention. It is what underlied the Pinochet precedent, if you remember the arresting of Augusto Pinochet, uh, an indictment by a Spanish judge in a British body, the reason why, in stripping his sovereign immunity as a diplomat for life, the reason why they could do that is because Chile, Spain, and Britain had signed the torture convention, and extradition requires double criminality. It has to be a crime in both countries. And so now you can actually extradite people on the basis of torture. And it then feeds into the ICC statute and feeds into torture as a war crime. So it's this process of layering on these obligations. The convention has a committee against torture, which monitors countries' compliance with it. And now the latest move in human rights are to create these national human rights commissions. I, I, Thomas might know how many countries have national human rights commissions, well over 100. These are domestic commissions in which local individuals can go and complain to about violations of human rights. So this institutionalization and this layering is how the process works. And the reason why I'm stressing this is because how is international law built and sustained? Redundancy is, is key. Because that means if you remove one layer, you don't actually unravel the entire system. So if you take a feather off the bird, the other feathers are still there, and they're protecting it. And so it's really important for locking in the system. Also, when you embed international law and influence the content of constitutions, then violations of international law become violations of domestic law. And then you're no longer a rule of law actor if you're willing to violate both domestic law and international law. So it, it also erases the line between international and domestic law and makes you forget often that it is tied to international law, which is both good and bad. Um, and it creates double criminality and it generates a series of institutions, which means that you can venue shop, which means that even if American courts are not going to delve into the torture that took place in the United States, European courts will. And I would say that John Yu does not travel in many places because he could be arrested in the universal jurisdiction and have cases brought against them. And so these multiple jurisdictions make it like a, a rabbit war, and you can't really escape by plugging a single hole. So the functional overlap is what I want to get you. And this is why international law, along with the fact that it's almost always followed almost all of the time, is not going to disappear no matter what Trump does. The third point I want to say about the success of international law is that it really is successful. And this is a, a well-known social science fact that I'm going to put out there, which is the decline of interstate war, which comes from Article 2 of the UN um, Convention, or the UN Statute, Article 2.4. All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the UN. This says in their international relations. This is a prohibition against interstate war and an authorization for using force only in defensive matters vis-a-vis -vis states and from threatening it regarding the territorial integrity or the political independence. This is why Trump's UN speech against North Korea really, really matters. But the remarkable thing that I think is widely recognized in social science is the extent to which it works. So also in my improv session, I had to follow uh, Hemingway and write a six-word story about international law. Here's my story, writing words to banish world war. And it has succeeded. So here are some figures on trends in state-based armed conflict by type. In blue were the colonial wars where Britain or France goes to Africa and commits war to support the colonial system, gone. This is interstate war, pretty much gone, and this is why the Crimea is such a big deal. The, the last example we have before that is the um, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, which of course was reversed, because going and seizing another territory, not okay. And this is why Russia tried to pretend there was a referendum and that it wasn't actually seizing the territory. But of course we have these other kinds of conflicts that are not influenced by Article 2.4. But nonetheless, this decline really matters when you consider battle deaths, because interstate war is far more violent. And as much as we feel like we live in a violent time, we actually don't. And this is something that Steven Pinker has talked about a lot. Violence has declined. The death in, in armed conflict has declined, because interstate war has declined. That's one example of how international law is tremendously effective. 
the, the data on human rights is a lot noisier, and maybe I'll get to that in the, in the discussion. But the, the fourth point I want to make about how international law works is that the United States has always been the leader in building international law and its primary opponent. Because we have in the United States a deep basis of support for multilateralism and a deep basis of isolationism. And that deep basis of isolationism wins quite often in US history. So I'm going to talk in a minute about the international liberal order, which is not the same thing as international law. But the international liberal order is the way that the US has ruled the world. It's an empire of law that the United States built post-World War II. Part of it was a big bang creation of international law. And this big bang is done because it's been made. We don't need to write a new law to seize the convention. Um, but now we have 37,000 active international organizations, over 200,000 international agreements that are in force. Almost all of these agreements are going to be followed by almost all countries, almost all of the time. And John, um, John Eikenberry has talked about how the United States emerged from World War II with overwhelming power and made its power not threatening by agreeing to this liberal international order. That being said, even though the United States has ruled in this way, we've also repeatedly stopped uh, our commitment to international law. So in 1950, the entire Havana Convention for the International Trade Organization was negotiated, and President Truman decides not to submit it to the US Congress for ratification. It dies. That was supposed to be the third pillar of the Bretton Woods system. It's not until 1995 that we're going to get the World Trade Organization, which looks a lot different than the ITO. A fully negotiated treaty goes down in flames because of US opposition. 1953, legal international law specialists know about the Bricker Amendment. I don't know how many of you have ever heard about it. John Bricker was a conservative. His arguments would be very recognizable today. He came within one vote of amending the Constitution. With, it had six provisions that would have just made it much more difficult to ratify any international treaty and would have prohibited any international law of having any domestic effect if it violated the Constitution. Um, and there were other provisions of it. When I say it came within one vote of passing, to amend the Constitution, you need two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate. The reason why it stopped one vote short is because the deal that John Foster Dulles made, which was not to submit any human rights treaties to ratification in the United States. The Southern Conservatives were worried that human rights treaties would undermine Jim Crow laws. And this came very close to being, would have still had to pass the states. But that is the depth of the conservative opposition in the 1950s. And it's part of why Truman doesn't want to submit the ITO charter for ratification. It wouldn't have succeeded. So in the 1960s, these human rights conventions get drafted with a lot of input from the multilateralist American forces, and they never get submitted for ratification. In 1983, Reagan takes this fully negotiated law, the Seas Convention, that was championed by um, Nixon and by Kissinger, and says, I'm not going to sign it, and I'm not going to submit it for ratification in the US, but I'm going to follow all of its provisions. The US is still not a member of the law, the Seas Convention. Reagan also says, I'm going to reverse everything that Jimmy Carter did in human rights. And he created the strategy that Trump now uses. He appointed Ernest Lefebvre, a person who hated human rights, to be in charge of overseeing American human rights policy. And, and Reagan did his best to dismantle the human rights policy of Carter. In 85, 86, there was a case where Nicaragua sued the United States in front of the International Court of Justice. Reagan withdrew from the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court ignored the decision. And this is when legal conservatives really started to hate international law. And you can trace their animus, especially Robert Bork was really incensed by this, this ruling. 2002, Bush says, unsigns the ICC Rome statute. I believe this is the first time we've had a president who unsigns an international treaty that the previous president signed. Then, of course, we have the Geneva Conventions do not apply to enemy combatants. And we have the illegal second Gulf War. I go through this to remind you the extent to which US opposition to international law has always existed, but international law progresses anyway. So what's the point of my story? <laughs> US opposition is an old story that will not change, but international law proceeds in anyway. I'm going to give you some highlights in the post-World War II period, and red are all the ones that go ahead even though the US opposes it. The Geneva Conventions, the United Nations that gets founded, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, I've already told you about this, the International Trade Organization fails, and what gets left over is the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and we build the whole trade system 
based on the GATT, which then becomes the World uh, Trade Organization. The coal and steel community gets launched. Europe basically goes its own way because the UN approaches to multilateralism and human rights are so deficient that the Europe has to go in a deeper way on its own. Meanwhile, they try the political community, it fails, and they get a much more truncated economic community. You get numerous human rights treaties that get written in the 60s and ratified and come into force in the 80s. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which despite what we say about North Korea and Iran, is one of the most successful arms control treaties in the history. The Law of the Seas Convention, which gets slowed down because of, of Reagan's opposition, but nonetheless passes and is the law of the land. The CAT Convention, which I told you about. The Montreal Protocol, which is the most effective international environmental agreement, widely signed. Oh, I think every country is a member, and it's widely followed. Ad hoc criminal tribunals. The World Trade Organization replaces the GATT. The Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court proceeds even though the US unsigns and opposes it. The Paris Climate Accord is going to repeat the Law of the Seas and the ICC. It's going to go ahead without the United States. So this opposition has always been there. It's always tried and often succeeded to stop American commitment to international law, but it doesn't stop international law. And so international law spills out like toothpaste out of the tube. And to try to get it back is impossible and very, very messy because it is multi-layered. So this is why the system is going to be resilient. It's deep and it's based on interest and it's so embedded in so many different institutions and countries, it's very hard to reverse. Okay, um, but let me get to the second point then. International law, therefore, is not under threat, but the international liberal order is. So I want to talk about three components of the international liberal order, the commitment to multilateralism, the commitment to human rights, and the commitment to the rule of law. But I would say it's pretty widely agreed that the promotion of democracy and free trade are also part of this order. I'll talk about them in Q&A if you want me to, but I'm not going to focus on them now. So what is multilateralism? And here I'm taking from John Ruggie. My point in this is, is actually an incredibly minimalistic definition. All it is is it's an institutional forum that coordinates relations among three or more states on the basis of generalized principles of conduct that is, principles which specify appropriate conduct for a class of actions without regard to the particular interest of the parties, the strategic exigencies that may exist at the time. Example of the law of the sea is the right of innocent passage. Ships that are not engaged in war um, have a right to go through sometimes even the territorial waters and straits, but also through the economic zones. Um, because they have a fundamental right of innocence passage. You might think that a, trip that's, uh, a ship that's coming from North Korea to Yemen has nuclear weapons on it. You still cannot board that ship because it has the right of innocent passage. That's a general principle of law based on an agreement of three or more states. There's no social values in here. There's no content to this. It's a very minimalist definition, which is why it's going to do just fine. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump can say, I don't care about this system, but here's the guy who's going to win from this. Because China's going to come right in, has already come right in, and said, we want a rules-based system. Of course, they want a rules-based system that they pick the rules that they want, which is the World Trade Organization. They want that. And there's other rules in which they want. And so seamlessly, China is, is already walking in to enforce and protect multilateralism. It's not a hard principle to protect because there's no content to it. But he will also protect most of the international legal agreements that China and other countries have signed and are enforced right now. So I'm not worried about multilateralism. That's going to stay because international law is going to stay. And almost all of the principles that are already part of this multilateral order, they're mostly going to stay most of the time. And I, I encourage you to look at this um, document created by the American Society of International Law, 100 Ways in Which International Law Shapes Our Lives. It gives you very everyday examples, the postal service, the airplane, the many ways in which you don't even realize that your life is guided by international law, and all of these are going to stay. This is what you have to worry about, human rights and the rule of law. I don't think this law and the books are going to change for the reason that I gave you of how the law is built and how it is sustained. You, you, can't, you can violate the torture provisions. You can call it enhanced interrogation techniques. But you can't actually unwind the law on the books because there's no political commitment to take law on the books off. You have to run and say, I want to torture so much that I'm going to actually get my parliament to legislate you can torture. It's better to just violate the law than go through with that. But it's also in so many different layers. 
So you're not going to be able to unwind law on the books. And that's going to be a saving grace, because then the law and the books can go into sleepy beauty mode. And they can just kind of sit there and be violated until a time comes when they'll be picked up and reinforced. What can be much more easily unwound are our expectations that countries actually follow human rights law. And that's the part that you have to worry about. Without the commitment to human rights, the international liberal order doesn't exist. We're back in the world of power politics, where the powerful countries can enact multilateral laws that promote their interests and then follow them. You need some content and some values. And human rights is the essential core of the liberal order that the US and Europe built following World War II. The other central core is the rule of law. Now, the rule of law, as we have learned by studying the populist movements that are rising now, is actually very easy to subvert. There's a whole playbook. You force retirement of the entire Supreme Court. You either fire them or you impose an age limit or in other ways you get rid of them. Or you reform the judiciary to improve access to justice. And your reforms are really ways to, to make your national judiciary <laughs> subservient. You have referendum to change the Constitution. It's actually not that hard to subvert the rule of law. I think it's harder in the United States than it's been proven in Turkey and Venezuela. But I don't think we should get overconfident that it can't be subverted because we've already seen court stacking mm -hmm. in many ways. It's much harder to subvert it at an international level, but I'm going to argue that the international level depends on the domestic commitment to the rule of law. So if you unwind the domestic commitment to the rule of law, then you're going to unwind the international commitment as well. Because international law depends on rule of law values and the preferences of people for legality and for law-abiding behavior. Behavior that is not legal is seen as illegitimate, as it should be. Um, which doesn't mean that behavior that is legal is definitely legitimate. The opposite is not true. But illegal behavior should be seen as illegitimate. And so can you unwind the expectations of human rights and the expectations of the rule of law? John Ruggie also said that international regimes, and I'm calling it international orders, fuse power and social purpose. And he makes an argument that you can Power and social purpose can become separated. And he's, he's making this argument looking at the decline of British power at the end of um, World War I and the vacuum that is then created, but then is eventually picked up by the United States. And so power can walk away, but if the social purpose then is retained in the many countries and in the many actors who believe in it, the order will be sustained. But the threat is that the social purpose will not be sustained, and in particular, the social purpose of human rights and the rule of law. That's really what is under threat. And it's really under threat because of populism, not because of American opposition to international law, which is longstanding. So if you want to see what the stormy skies are about, it's about national populism. This is not my definition of it, but here's a good definition of it. There are many definitions of it. It's national. It's an atavistic veneration of the nation. It's populist. It's a veneration of the common man, and it's anti-elite. It substitutes the values of human rights and the rule of law. For that, it substitutes traditionalism, purity, unity, and friend-enemy distinctions. And its primary core of, of unity is around anti-politics, all the things that you don't like not all the things that you do like, because if you had to articulate all the things you do like, you wouldn't have the coalition of support around it. But you, what they're denigrating are as elites, but they're also denigrating pluralist democracy and the core values of pluralist democracy, and they're denigrating foreigners. So they're trying to unite everyone around everything that they can oppose and agree to oppose, because that's easier than organizing around something you can agree to. So this is the larger threat, and it's the threat to the social values of human rights and of the rule of law. It's going back to this idea. This is the picture of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. And that's a famous political treatise where it justifies authoritarian rule to provide security. But the idea of the Leviathan, it's not a very good picture, so it's hard to see. These are people. So the Leviathan is a democratic institution because it's the, the ruler is the people. And that's exactly what populism says. I am you, you are me, and I am ruling in your name. And they're going back to the Leviathan, which was an authoritarian government. So you unwind the expectations by saying what the people want and need matters more than human rights, the rule of law, and democracy. That is the current threat that we're facing. So cool story. What's my point? <laughs> 
U.S. opposition to international law is not going to change. It's an old story. International law is going to proceed. The Paris Climate Accord is going to proceed. Would it proceed better with U.S. support? Sure. Faster, more thoroughly? Sure. But it's going to proceed anyway. But the international liberal order may not proceed. Don't take it for granted because it may not proceed. So on what does it depend? And here, since the content of international law is shaped by the values of the multilateral, the international liberal order, um, that's what we have to focus on. The basis of international law depends on self-interest. The law of the seas treaty is going to survive because of self-interest. Um, but the international law, liberal order depends on our commitment to its social purpose. And if we give up its social purpose, then some of the most important aspects of, hum, of international law and human rights will go with it. So international law has always had critical failures. Here's another quote by Lewis Hankin from the same book. Much law is observed because it is the law and because its violation would have undesirable consequences. He who does violate is punished principally to reaffirm the standard of behavior and to deter others. In international society, too, is law is not effective against the Hitlers, and it's not needed for a nation which is content with its lot and has few temptations. International law aims at nations which are in principle law-abiding, but which might be tempted to commit a violation if there were not a threat of undesirable consequences. International law does not work against the Hitlers. And by the way, neither does domestic law. Domestic law does not work against truly, truly powerful people that are bent on destruction. You can't expect law to curb those kinds of people. You need power and you need politics to curb those kinds of people. That's not the source. So when the sociopaths violate international and in domestic law, you have to come at them with another way. The reason why you have law and legal enforcement are the people who are in principle law abiding but might be tempted to, to violate if there was no consequence whatsoever for violating. And so when you have a populist leader that wants to test how far can they violate the rule of law and their own constitution and no one will say anything, which was the same test that Hitler used to see how far he could go of stripping rights of people and see if no one will say anything. Put a Muslim ban. Will anyone say anything? Apply that Muslim ban even to green card holders. Strip the citizenship of Americans. Will people say anything? Um, that's the spot that you're aiming for with the law. So international law has always had its challengers. These are the newest ones, but any authoritarian leader has always been its challengers. And it's always had its American opponents. These are not the Hitlers of the world, but that's Bricker. That's Reagan, who Trump is just following his entire, the, Reagan withdrew from UNESCO, Trump is withdrawing from UNESCO. You know, there's a lot of similarities there. George Bush, they also followed international law. Reagan coupled his, I'm not going to sign the law of the sea treaty with a statement, but I'm going to follow all of its principles. I'm not going to participate in the Nicaragua proceedings, but I am going to accept the International Court of Justice territorial settlement with Canada. So he did not walk away 100%. And neither did George Bush. The, the second half of the Bush administration, he spent trying to ratify the law of the sea convention. And so there were many commitments of international law that he wanted to follow. Over time, you find that political leaders become more and more multilateral over time, although I don't necessarily predict that for Trump for reasons we can talk about. And that's Jesse Helms, who was head of the Foreign Relations Committee in the United States, who was very opposed to international law and wanted to pass all kinds of American statutes that would directly violate international law. So we've always had our opponents in the United States. This guy's a little bit different. We can talk about that. But his difference comes down to the populist elements. That's what's different about him, is the nationalist populism. If the, if the social purpose underneath this international liberal order loses support, then international law as we know it won't survive. And this is what we should be concerned about. That's what the wrecking ball is aimed at. Now, I said also in the book, I was very clear that the permissive condition of this international legal system working was a commitment to the rule of law. And I said the international rule of law is an important backup for the shortcomings of the domestic rule of law, but it'll never be a substitute. Rather, increasingly, the international and domestic inter uh, rule of law are intertwined and codependent, <coughs> rising and falling in legitimacy and effectiveness together. This is both because international law is so woven into the fabric of domestic law that they will rise and fall together, but also because much of my work, which I haven't talked about today, is that the way that international works is through the legal practices of 
lawyers, law professors, judges, government officials who are constantly rebuilding, defining the meaning of international law, rebuilding the commitments to international law. This is what political scientists left out, was the entire community of lawyers who keep the legal system running, and law is the way in which we govern today. But don't be fooled. If international law goes, so goes the domestic rule of law. Don't think you're going to have one without the other, because you're not. Why this talk? Why this essay? Because of these guys and their threat to the future of the international liberal order and of the rule of law. What is the antidote for it? The defense of social values, which can only be defended by people on the street caring about it. That's what I wanted to say. So you want to come up and talk? Wow. <laughs> Um, hmm. Problem is, I was assigned the task of a discussant. Problem is, if you pretty much agree with almost everything that has been said, you have a very hard time to be a discussant. Um, okay, four short points, and then you can answer and we see, and then we open up, okay? Um, the, the one thing I actually didn't really get, and I'm slightly confused, Mm -hmm. is the relationship between international law and what you call the international liberal order. Because I heard you saying uh, international law is going to survive no matter what. That was in the first part. And in the end you said if the international liberal order or if people don't believe in that anymore and it loses its social purpose, then international law as we know it is gone. So there seems to be a connection between the two, mm -hmm. and I was confused. And I would like you to clarify this. Uh, secondly, on, on Trump, um, I think I completely, I completely agree. Um, particularly Europeans shouldn't, uh, shouldn't panic too much. Uh, my advice to Europeans is just ignore the guy. I think the, the, the impact on America is, is uh, an American domestic politics is way worse than on anything international, for some of the reasons you gave, mm -hmm. okay? Um, one thing I, that I saw missing, there was a little, there, uh, Xi Jinping came up once, but my question is, the, the future of international law, multilateral, I mean, on human rights, I give you that, right? You will not get the Chinese uh, uh, subscribing the, the human rights part. What about the rule of law part? That's a, that's a kind of different story. So, so where is China and all the other emerging powers in that whole story about the future? Mm -hmm. Okay, Because it was, in a way, it was very Western-centric, yeah. the talk, right? So, so I'd like to hear more about that. And my, f my last point, but uh, <laughs> with your last slide, <laughs> you made exactly the point I wanted to make uh, on, the, on, on, on populism, in a way, in, in my view, the good news is that stuff we knew, attitudes we knew people were holding, and we, for Europe, we know that for the last 20 years that you have 15 to 20 percent of people holding these type of attitudes. For the first time now, they get mobilized. There are all kinds of reasons for this, but they get mobilized. At least that kind of attitude by now is out in the open. And it's the duty of the other guys uh, now to not take the liberal order for granted, but to really defend it. And uh, I mean, you, you only have these guys, but there's another guy who actually showed how you can do this, and, and his name is Emmanuel uh, Macron, okay? He fought them, mm -hmm. and he got uh, Le Pen down to, uh, down to 30% in the, in, the, in, the, in the first thing. Then secondly, you have now I talk, I'm talking about the U.S., which is sort of my mm -hmm. second home. Um, you have social mobilization, including the courts, and, and you might want to talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit, uh, uh, like you never had in the U.S. Uh, back yeah. to the, probably back to the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. so if, what, if, yeah. if you think about it. And civil okay. rights movement. So, okay. So on those, Go for those it. four, okay. <laughs> So 
international law is not contentless, but the commitment, much of the international law is not about values. You know, the law of the sea is a coordination device we talk about in international relations. So a lot of international law is about coordination. Drive on the right side. If you start to drive on the left side, you'll have lots of car accidents. And just tell me the rules of the road so that we can drive and not have car accidents. That content is going to stay and it's going to be sustained by self-interest. But John Ruggie also said that it matters who makes the international legal order because values matter. So imagine that the Soviets had won and it had been the Soviets that had built the post-war order. That would have been a vastly different post-war order. The post-war order that was built by the United States and Europe, Ruggie talked about embedded liberalism and I'm not, it was a much more balanced capitalist system, but it was also fundamentally human rights and democracy. In retrospect, many of us remember fondly the Cold War because you knew who the enemy was and you knew what the alternative was. And the alternative was democracy and human rights and the rule of law. And that's exactly what totalitarian and Soviet states did not have. That is the social value content. That is why people want to invest in the system and maintain the system. Yes, no one wants to tear down the rules of the road. No one has a better sense of you know, right side, left side, it doesn't matter, just tell me which one. But if you want the values and if you want the meaning and the way of life that you want to create, it has to have the social values and that's the international liberal order, which is there in the agreements themselves, in the WTO that promotes trade but also allows derogations for public policy values. The system's got a bit out of whack, but it's in there. So this need to balance trade with other public agendas and human rights, which is the essential protector of individual rights vis-a-vis -vis the government. And so that's the separation that I'm trying to create. Hopefully that is clearer now. The second one was... Trump. Tr oh, Trump. Well, <laughs> so I, no, I'm not as sanguine as you guys are. And, I mean, I, and partly because I think that Europeans shouldn't be as sanguine too. Don't ignore this guy because he could easily create World War III. And he could easily create a trade war. You have to be defending the system uh, because there's no other carrier of it now. I mean, against China, Europe is the alternative. It's the defender of the international liberal order. And if Europe gets overconfident and doesn't pay attention to the chaos bombs that Trump likes to throw, you will find it its underpinnings undermined. So I'm not as sanguine about, about that. I think we really have to pay attention to what populism and Trump and, and the continual machinery that he puts into place now that he has not just the bully pulpit, but the institutions of the US government and the resources that he puts into place. I'm not near a sanguine about it. The third was the, the rule of law. China. It was China, okay, with China. And so what does the rule of law mean to China? I'm going to China in May and I'm preparing it precisely to figure out this question. On the one hand, not that I'll figure it out in two weeks, but on the one hand, China's been building law schools like it's been building energy infrastructure. Because they know for capitalism to work, you need a legal system, you need legal regulation. And if you guys are gonna trust Chinese products to not lead to buildings that collapse in, in, in um, earthquakes, and to not have baby food that you would never want to feed your kids because it's full of poison. You need a regulatory state. You need an administrative state, and they get that. So on the one hand, they're trying to build the rule of law in a, in a totally administrative, not constitutional way. Because they've also come out very recently, their Supreme Court president has come out and said, the rule of law stops at the Communist Party. And the other problem that they have is China is very, very corrupt. And, I, and, and the patronage system is maintained by this corruption. So can you simultaneously get an administrative rule of law state and tolerate the corruption that is needed for the patronage system to survive? They're trying to thread a very thin needle. Mm. And I don't know exactly what they mean by this needle. So in May, I'm gonna go over and spend some time at some different law schools, because I wanna hear how they talk about it. They talk about the rule of law, but what do they mean by the rule of law? And so the rule of law can have different versions. It can be an administrative state, which has no human rights, no constitutional check. It can also, though, slip into what we call a rule by law, where the government takes over, they already have the legislative apparatus, that's what a government is, but it also takes over the judiciary. And then you just revise the laws and revise the judges and revise the constitution so that you control every part of the apparatus of the law. Let me just give you a little example. Um, 
of Mugabe's system and how he took land rights away from, yeah. from white people. What he did was, of course, he replaced the entire judiciary, which uh, in Africa they still had colonial judiciaries and a lot of white people <laughs> that were their judges. And so the, all of the land rights claims kept losing in, in, in Zimbabwean courts. And he got very, very frustrated that the, the farmers kept winning and he kept trying to seize the land. So he replaced the judges on, on improving the legal system and making it more plur democratic and pluralistic and more like the people. He passed a constitutional amendment which made it impossible to challenge land rights claims inside of um, Zimbabwean courts. And he then ran into trouble with the Sadic Tribunal. But he, he ruled by law, and then he would wield the law against political opponents. That's what goes on right now in Russia. It's impossible to survive in Russia without violating some tax code. And then they use that tax code to hang it over your head so they can prosecute political opponents whenever they want for tax uh, evasion or for corruption. That's ruling by law. And China's corruption drive is part of that, too. So I'm looking for when it slips from rule of law into rule by law. So I don't have an answer to China, but I'm definitely thinking about that. Um, for legal institutions, this is going to be interesting. I, I generally agree with Tim Schneider that we should not have too much faith in our institutions to protect us. The, the institutions need the people on the street. In order for judges and politicians to be brave, they have to believe that they're not going to be sanctioned for doing so, and that if they are sanctioned, that the people will come out and defend them. And so, well, I think Trump is, you know, he's so self-destructive of his own causes that he's managed to piss off the entire legal community. And on the one hand, he can assuage many conservative supporters by appointing very conservative judges. But on the other hand, even conservative legal scholars don't like what he says about, well, this Mexican judge is biased because he's Mexican. And they're like, wait a second, that's, that's, we're not going there. And so a very interesting development is to see Eric Posner, no friend of international law, no friend of human rights, one of the most outspoken Trump critics from, from the legal side because he thinks Trump is destroying the Constitution. So, um, well, I think it's, it's interesting and I'm hopeful that the courts will slow him down. It takes time to take over the judicial system, but that's where they're going to go because that's the one thing that his, his supporters can actually pass is to repack the judiciary now that they've blown up the filibuster. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, in the interest of time, we have about 20 minutes left, and then there's going to be a reception. So, so should we collect like so three comments at a time? That is exactly what I suggest. Yeah. Uh, three comments at a time. And please remember what Michael said, uh, pose questions, and questions tend to have question marks in the end, and brief, please briefly uh, introduce yourself. We start in the back. Reginka, evil business lawyer, um, in international, public international lawyer as well, but uh, this is only by amateur uh, reasons. My two questions. Um, um, you address the players in the international field, and this is why I would like to ask um, as to whether or not there are tendencies to in, incorporate to some, uh, some way or uh, get to the uh, private corporations, the multinational private co corporations, as they happen to be some of the major players all over the world, and none of uh, or most of the international regulations don't seem to address those players or only in part. Um, and the second would allude to the second issue, uh, which would mean outsourcing of uh, governmental uh, foreign policy issues uh, to private uh, companies as well in, in respective conflict areas. Thank you. Second one was over here. Nothing, <coughs> Christian Tomaschardt, uh, Humboldt University. Nothing about incidental occurrences, just one question of principle. The United States, on the one hand, ratifies the International Covenant on civil and political rights. Well, human rights, wonderful. You talk much about human rights, but in a declaration they said, uh, these uh, rights shall not be self-executing. So they are not applicable within the United States. They have never been applied in the United States. So, uh, well, as such, as such, uh, I have to uh, specify that. Uh, so on the one hand, the U.S. looks fine. It is a party to the worldwide universal covenant on U the human rights. On the other hand, it's no, it has no substance at all within the United States. Mm -hmm. Third one? Yes. 
Hello, okay, I'm Arlette von Chris. I would like to know uh, if the, uh, an agreement about the peaceful use of outer space has a chance in international law as you told us today. Okay. Okay. Quick uh, answer, so that we yeah. can have. So I'm I'm very laws. worried about turning over um, law, both domestic and international, to corporations, and I think it's gone too far in the United States and even internationally with investor disputes. I know many international lawyers are committed to investor dispute systems because it's very lucrative. But I think when you create this single issue system that doesn't have appropriate balancing for public and private, and that that happens when you turn over regulatory power to private actors. So I'm very worried about this trend, and I think in a lot of the ways that the neoliberalism has gone too far to the side, and the, and the private is not a substitute for the public. U.S. civil and political rights uh, not self-executing. This was the Bricker Amendment deal. This is because of the Bricker Amendment. We said we wouldn't ratify any human rights treaties, or if we ratify the treaty, it doesn't become self-executing in American law. At the time, they were worried about Jim Crow rules, but part of the Bricker Amendment was to have no international law would have any effect if it violated the Constitution. They wanted to rely on the US Constitution rather than any international law. And so the Bricker Amendment, which has now been added to by a reversal of the supremacy clause of the US Constitution, and uh, Jens Olin has written about this on the assault on international law, and so has uh, David Schloss, who's really looked at how lawyers rewrote <coughs> our supremacy clause by this, the US Constitution supremacy clause used to be that ratified treaties would then become the law of the land. And then they wrote it in to say only if the ratification says that the treaty itself is self-executing is it like that. So before, if the assumption was that the treaty was self-executing, then you wouldn't put it in the law that it was self-executing. So you had all of these laws that were not written in as self-executing. So by changing the understanding of the supremacy clause to only apply to self-executing treaties and making sure now that treaties are not self-executing and then just by omission we thought they were but we didn't bother to say, you pull into question the whole status of a series of international laws. There are even more extreme examples of it, but this is exactly an artifact of the, of the Bricker Amendment and what they were looking for. Um, and to some extent, you know, constitutional provisions are substitutes, but to some extent they're not. I really think that international law is an important back, backup for constitutional provisions. Uh, peaceful use of outer space. So in the paper on the future of international law, I talk about three current issue areas. I go into more detail about human rights, but then I talk about climate, drones, and, um, and cyber space. I don't talk about outer space, but I think that I basically say in climate, they'll go ahead without the United States, and firms will go ahead too. Um, in drones, I think that the US is making a critical mistake, but it's gonna be like nuclear weapons. We're not gonna try to do something about it until this usage spreads. But meanwhile, it is going to spread. And drones are really, really frightening that they can be commandeered. So I don't expect a lot of changes. But for cyber warfare, I do expect international law to evolve, not necessarily for states, but for the um, pirates that are, using inter that are using the cyber realm. So I think for areas where you can find common interest, you'll see international law to continue at a slower pace because the big bang times are over. But as new issues arise, You'll get some law, but it'll be a lot like the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We get to keep our nuclear weapons. You guys don't. Um, and you can't replicate that model for everything. Uh, but I think that that's worse. I'm not convinced that um, use of the peaceful use in outer space, I'm not convinced that we're actually there technologically capable. So that's why I worry more about drones and cyber warfare than I worry about outer space. But maybe I'm uninformed and naive on that. <laughs> okay, <coughs> let's do a, ne a second round. Uh, John is first. Come on. Yes. Um, you mentioned one, you used actually one word, which I would like to you to elaborate on because I'm not sure I agree with it, but I'm not sure what you mean. So it's mm -hmm. it's something like social conditions or social, social rights. Social values. Social values. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's a relevant term. Mm 
because everybody's got different social values. Um, what I do th believe, I believe it very strongly, it, and I had a, a few decades of experience with this, that international law is based on civil society. Um, the United States follows or doesn't follow international law because of its societal needs to do it or not to do it. Russia follows international laws in different ways depending on how its civil society is organized. And so I, I think maybe you're talking about the same thing with your social needs, yeah. but maybe you're not. Yeah. Because I think that the international liberal order, which we're all sort of shedding great tears about right now, was essentially the United States enforcing order on the world and enforcing it on the basis of our own internal beliefs and our, the strength of our civil society. There has not been an international liberal order. There has been the United States directed, luckily liberal order. Now we're coming into a new era, and that's why I think that you, I'd still like you to describe your social nice. rights mm -hmm. thing, because I think in the end the key is going to be how societies develop from within. What do I need as an American or a Chinese or a Russian or a Uruguayan? Yeah. What do I need to do to <coughs> relate to the rest of the world? And I think you've got a concept there, but I wasn't quite clear what it was. Okay. Right behind you. Uh, Kati Martin, um, uh, excellent uh, mm -hmm. uh, a presentation, Karen. Thank you for it. Um, you um, implied that that um, between Trump and and utter uh, chaos and disaster, only the people in the streets uh, can prevent that. Uh, without mentioning that, that in fact we have another political party that actually had mm -hmm. vastly more support in the last election mm -hmm. and that we have uh, midterm elections coming up in a year so that we don't all of us have to take to the streets just yet. Um, so could you address that? Uh, granted mm -hmm. that the Democrats have been in a state of shock since the election, but um, I have mm -hmm. to hope and believe that, that they will uh, rouse themselves from that shock. And, and uh, similarly, uh, you showed us a rogues gallery of populists without mentioning uh, we happen to be in the country that, that is headed by um, the, the chancellor on, on whose uh, leadership a great deal of uh, the hope for l sustained liberal order mm -hmm. rests, Chancellor Merkel. You mentioned Macron, but Merkel is the senior partner mm -hmm. of that partnership. So uh, in some ways, the, the liberal order that John referred to has now, responsibility for maintaining that has now shifted mm -hmm. uh, to the US's former protege, mm -hmm. where we are currently. <laughs> Next question is right behind you. Uh, yes. you. Wolfgang Grauitz, retired from Foreign Office. Very odd question. What is Sharia law? Is it international law? Could you elaborate a little bit? So, uh, while you answer, could you also answer Christian Tomoshat's question on the U.S. being, you know, uh, signing up to all kinds of uh, international treaty, but in the end what matters is domestic law? Well, I thought I did answer that in terms of self-executing. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so, I clearly, you know, I've gotten this question a couple of times, so I'm not clear enough on the social values and on the international liberal order. That's human rights and, and the rule of law were the two that I was singling out. And, and I'm struggling with where democracy fits into that, because the democracy has been such a thin veneer, and democracy promotion has been a problematic enterprise. But I am saying that the values that inspire people to, to stand up for a system, it's a system that they like. And this in the Cold War were the core values that separated us from the Soviet empire, was constitutional democracy that was protected by the rule of law with limited governments that was protected by courts that would find judicial review that would find limits to the exercise of power. So you can call that constitutional democracy. I'm calling that rule of law that governments are below, uh, are, are subordinate to the law as well. And to the content in, of the social values, which is the human rights agenda, to respect for individuals and human rights. Um, I think you you leave out not the junior partner, but the partner of the United States in this, which was Europe. And in the 1990s, when the US wanted to 
have a peace dividend and save money. It was Europe that put the money and the energy where its mouth was and became a democracy promotion, human rights promotion regime and um, system. And so I think that it's always been a team effort by the United States and Europe. And now we rely on Europe a lot. I didn't speak to Macron. I think it's, I'm a little bit wait and see with Macron. I don't actually know who he is and what he stands for and whether he has the political skills to succeed in his effort, or he might become tremendously unpopular. And I, I hope that Merkel can can still rule with her weekend basis because I was, I was putting a lot of faith in it. Um, more faith than at the moment I'm a Democrat, but then I have in the Democrats because they're really not offering any alternative. And I think they're going to have to lose big again in order to actually regroup. Mm -hmm. I think the narrative that we won, which I think is right, we did, I mean, Clinton got more votes, is not actually helpful. It's cold comfort. People might, um, if there's better turnout, and a lot of people didn't vote because they didn't think voting matters, and they didn't think so much was at stake, and they thought that mm -hmm. Clinton was going to win. So the next elections are going to turn on turnout. But um, this is why I'm not quite as sanguine as, as some people in Europe seem to be about Trump. He is setting up to blame all of his failings on the Congress. He's a, he's a man who never owns any errors. But he's, he's definitely setting up to say the problem is that Congress fails to pass health care, tax reform, everything that fails, even the Iran Accord. It's Congress that fails. And I think that he can run against this again. So, you know, Macron, you can get elected once, but can you get elected again um, that's the real test. And I think as long as the Democrats are not offering any alternative, and any real alternative, because the, the Trump, the, the voters who voted for Obama and then voted for Trump saw no difference between the Democrat and the Republican Party, and certainly not between the Clintons. And they said the Democrats were just as in the swamp and, and in the pockets of special interests as the conservatives are. I don't think that most Americans see a heck of a lot of difference between the two. And so I, I don't think that the Democrats, you have to have an alternative. And Trump is setting up to blame the Congress, and the Democrats do not yet have an alternative. And that's why I think we have to be a not in my name and out on the street to push both the Democrats and to say we're not going to just roll over on American values as you stamp on them. We actually care about them and even hold Trump to them. He's testing all of the waters with the NFL. It kills me. The price of freedom is some guy in Las Vegas mowing down a lot of people. But the price of freedom is not football players kneeling at the national anthem. I mean, that is ridiculous. And that people don't see that, we have to keep reminding people what actually is and is not a price of freedom. Sharia law? Sharia law. Sharia law, not, I mean, it's not my area of specialties. The, the, and I don't think I understand, truly understand Sharia law enough to say. What's always frightened me about Sharia law is, you know, I believe in the secular state. Sharia law fuses um, theocracy and law. And therefore, you hand over to the theocrats ruling. And, and, and religions always trumped life in a moral code. They'll say, you know, you have to satisfy God more than you have to satisfy the state. When you unite a God-based law with a state-based law, you give over the interpretive power to the, um, you know, the, the faithful, to the priests. And uh, I'm... I don't think that's the rule of law. I don't think you can possibly have the rule of law. If the speakers of the law are those speaking on behalf of God, you can't have the rule of law because you don't have government subordinate to the law. You fused that power. So in that sense, um, Sharia law worries me. Often Sharia law operates in a pluralist system. So you have state law and you have Sharia law, and you have certain areas that you give over Sharia law, which is, of course, a problem for human rights if you give over family law to Sharia law. That's indirect tension with human rights. Um, but I think in societies that are deeply religious and that are already governed by Sharia law, some form of pluralism is going to be the way in which you try to square that circle. But it's not an area that I specialize in, so those are just my thoughts on it. So I guess we have time for one quick round, and this is the last round before the reception. So you go first. <laughs>
Eckart Klein, University of Potsdam. Um, it is interesting, but perhaps also a bit naive, that you thought that you are not afraid of the future of international law because it's difficult to destroy or to abolish. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you you are afraid of the international legal liberal order. I. I think what I have missed is the idea of the close connection between both. I don't think that the, uh, the, the destruction of an international liberal order would not also impact international law. Mm -hmm. That is a bit, they, they, they belong together. And mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't really, uh, if international law was was forming this international liberal order that we have today, then the destruction of the one will also impact the other. And as you wished a, a, a question mark at the end, do you do you agree? <laughs> True lawyer. There was a person right behind. Yes. <laughs> and then Anne. <laughs> Malcolm Jorgensen from the Berlin Potsdam Research Group into the rule of law. Actually, it's very closely related to the question that has just preceded. Um, I am thinking about the application of this distinction between the continuation of law but not the liberal order in the Asia Pacific and China's behaviour in the South China Sea. So as um, Donald Trump signals less commitments to upholding rules in that region, it seems that China, for instance, is now creating law-free zones in that area. Mm -hmm. And the um, removal of American power there means that there's no effective response to that. Is that an exception to this argument that uh, law will continue? And what's the value of saying that international law will continue um, when China can put forward essentially contorted interpretations um, in this part of the world? OK, last question is right here. Yeah, Anne Peters, I'm an international legal scholar, uh, Heidelberg and Berlin. Um, isn't another reason for the ongoing of international law, the interdependence and the existence of global problems, which won't go away, but mm. which are exacerbated, yeah. climate, traffic, mm. uh, migration, terrorism, and so on, so that, that yeah. therefore there's no other option. And then concerning the social values, isn't an important point the material wealth and the desire of people to keep their wealth? The Chinese being like bought off by the fact that they have been lifted out mm -hmm. of poverty and the xenophobia and the rich countries being very much linked to the fact that they don't want to share, that they don't want to get have migrants getting social benefits. Okay, so I'm, I'm clearly having a problem with this international law and the liberal order. So, um, <laughs> and so I did say that the international law as we know it um, will be threatened, and that is the international liberal order. So the components of it, which might be free trade, human rights, democracy promotion, I don't think is actually written as much in, in international law. That was more of a policy than it was an international legal system um, element. Um, those pieces will go away. I mean, they will, they will in, our, in the best case scenario, go in what I call sleeping beauty mode. They'll just go to sleep and wait to be awakened by the prince. And I think when you have mass violations of human rights, that's when it always awakes. When you go through really dark times, in the end, I think that people will carry a desire for their <coughs> rights and for justice. But you have to go through a really dark period to awaken that. But I do think that the international liberal order and the international laws that are associated with that liberal order are very much under threat, including human rights. The ones that are about com what I called common bads, which is what Ann Peters you know, mentioned again, are all of the ways international law is how we do international diplomacy. You bring countries together. You make either soft law or hard law agreements. You try to coordinate to address the common bads that are not going to go away. The ransomware people, which is probably North Korea, but none, nonetheless, 
is, is something that nobody wants, that you could take down entire electrical systems through cyber warfare. Those have to be dealt with. And the only tool in the toolkit to deal with them are international legal agreements that you then implement through a series of institutions. So in the end of the day, I'm an institutionalist. Institutions are sticky, although they can be taken over. They're sticky and they're huge, big bureaucracies. And so I have faith in the, in the legal system because it's so full of really sticky institutions that are hard to unwind in terms of global replacing all the people and in terms of global replacing all the rules. But I have less faith that the people in office will have courage if they don't think that they're backed by the street, that they will stand up to their bosses, that they will stand up to power. They will do that if they believe that their principles are backed by their friends, by their communities, and by the street. And if not, then they will protect their lives and protect their jobs by becoming lackeys. Um, so. I do think that the international legal order as we know it, the human rights part of it, and the rule of law part of it, are very much under threat. Recognizing, however, that almost all international law will be obeyed almost all the time, that's all the coordination law, that's all the common bads law, and that's all going to continue. And so in that sense, we're not going to have total chaos and not going to have total mm. disorder. But the parts that we might care about, human rights, democracy, rule of law, that very much might go away because I think that people are much easier to change in terms of their values and what they're willing to do than our institutions. Institutions are slow and cumbersome. And that's why I, I put faith in institutions, although Trump is um, accomplishing more through institutional transformation than he is through, through political transformation. Um, so the U.S. has created a vacuum in the South China Seas, and China is going to go in to fill it. And then the question is whether Asian countries are going to give up on the promise of the United States supporting them. I mean, Abe just won re-election, and his, one of his goals is to change the Ch uh, Japanese constitution and to not rely on the, the nuclear and the military umbrella of the United States. And so you're going to see a lot more balancing against China, and that's a very dangerous situation. It can trip over to the other side of war. I haven't actually read Graham Allison's Thucydides chat, uh, trap, but I think this is what he's talking about. And so I'm very worried about the vacuums that the United States are creating in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. I think it's a very risky system. I'm not near as sanguine you are. Ignore Trump. There's only so much he can do. He'll only affect the United States and not the international system. I think he's going to greatly affect it because China's going to move in, and I don't think any of us really know what values China is going to defend. It's, China's been very transactional up until now, and the way it's led in the international system. But as it gets more confident and walks into the vacuums, I don't think that we know where it's going to go. I won't rely on interdependence. That was the old reason why you couldn't have World War II, because the economies were too independent, and look, we had World War II. So, and, and the, the idea that we'll shred NAFTA, I mean, which is totally the U.S. economy depends on it. I don't think that the populace necessarily care how completely undermining of the self-interest it is. We're in an age of ideas, uh, imaginaries, fictions, myths, whatever you want to call them, and that is overtaking reason and interest. Um, that being said, it's, it's much more easy. Um, Americans feel that war is not going to affect them. And war hasn't affected Americans for a very, very long time. They don't even, many of them don't even really worry about a nuclear war in North Korea because they don't see how that's going to affect them and the fact that millions of people will die. <coughs> well, it's not them. And um, so it's really a problem, this tendency to want to pull up the ladder and feel very safe inside of our American and liberal bubbles. Um, and so that's, but the only antidote to that are values and principles and belief systems. And so you've got to really reinforce what we stand for in the American system. It doesn't have to be standing for international law and American politics. That's not going to win the Democrats' elections. Just stand for our Constitution. Just defend the Constitution. And that's why international law and domestic law are being woven together in the same fabric. I'm OK with that. I'm OK with relying on the US Constitution and not making any, every international treaty self-executing. It's a balance. Um, I, I, do I wish that the United States was checked more? And, and do I wish that our Supreme Court was much more like the Bundesverfassungsgericht in terms of its friendly approach to international law? Absolutely, I wish it was like that. 
because I think it would be better for the United States and better for the world. That being said, I, don't, I, I think there's this constant tension between democratic constitutional values and international values, and they're codependent. They do depend on each other, and they're both under threat. Super. Mm -hmm. Okay, one little <laughs> sentence on Trump, yeah. if I may. I misspoke, I didn't mean ignore Trump, but do your thing. Do and we thing. did it as far as the Paris Agreement yeah. is concerned. We had G, Don't wait for we him, had G5 actually. plus one, we had G19 plus one, so we isolated the United States on the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. We're currently the EU negotiating. There was a thing on the books with, with Japan for a long time. It's now ratified, so we need to preserve the free trade order, no matter mm -hmm. what, the, what, what the Americans do. So I, yeah, I, 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 I want to clarify, clarify so that I'm not misunderstood. Um, uh -huh. Okay, the conversation on the liberal order and the relationship to international law is something we all need to discuss further. Here's a little announcement. If you're interesting, uh, in, in, uh, interested in these conversations, actually there's a, an event tomorrow at the Fire Universität. We're going to have a book lounge of a book that's coming out with Cambridge University Press called Human Rights Futures. So it's exactly on the topic uh, we, we, we've been talking about, and we're going to have Jack Snyder from Columbia University, uh, Leslie Vinjamuri from the uh, School of Oriental and African Studies in London, uh, and, and myself uh, discussing human rights issues. And if you're interested, just ask me and i tell you where to find this place uh, tomorrow. It's, it's from 4 to 6 at the Freie Universität. So, uh, last not least, let's, let's now uh, thank Karen. I think I, did, I, I said exactly the right thing in the beginning. You saw a brilliant bridge builder between law and politics. On top of it, you saw somebody who has a superb command of empirical details. I thought I knew a lot of the stuff on human rights. No, I learned a couple of details that I didn't know before uh, tonight. And last not least, you saw a person with a very clear normative commitment. And I think this is very important in these times. So thanks a lot, Karen. Thank you.